Play mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Ben Frost. I'm the Public Information Officer of APA's Northern New England chapter and one of the coordinators of the planning webcast series. This series is brought to you by a consortium of over 40 of APA's chapters and divisions. And the consortium itself is not affiliated with APA, but rather is a hallucinate association whose mission is to provide high quality free webinars on topics important to planners that will also help them to meet their certification maintenance requirements. Today is Friday, June 3rd, 2016, and we will hear the presentation, Be Project Ready, Go from Opportunistic to Strategic Green Infrastructure. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions into the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or call the 1-800 number shown here. For content-related questions related to the presentation, type those questions into the question box, also located in the to webinar toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. We will answer those questions as time allows at the end of the presentation during Q&A. Here on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions, and I want to take a moment to thank all of them for uh, helping us to make these webcasts possible, free to you uh, as members of these chapters and divisions. Today's webcast is sponsored by the County Planning Division of APA. And here's a list of a few of our upcoming webcasts. We do have a full slate for the entire rest of the year, which is really great, and we've actually started to schedule things for 2017. So if you have an idea for a webcast, uh, get that to the coordinator in your chapter or division, and they'll forward that on to me. Um, we have a, a, a great slate of uh, webcasts coming up on a variety of topics. To register for any of these, please visit our website, which is at www.ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, follow these instructions. Go to planning.org, log into your account at APA, navigate to planning.org slash CM, select activities by provider at the top of the screen, type in county planning division, and you can select the title, be project ready, etc or you can search by the event number, which is 9016766. Today's webcast is approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. You can like us on Facebook, where we provide up-to-date information on upcoming events in the planning webcast series. We are recording today's webcast, and this will be available on our YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube and search planning webcast. A PDF of today's PowerPoints will also be available on the ohioplanning.org webpage. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Lauren Long is a coastal conservation specialist at NOAA's Office of Coastal Management, and Tasha Allen is a coastal hazard specialist working for the Baldwin Group at NOAA's uh, Office of Coastal Management. Laura, I'm going to hand it over to you now. All right, thank you. And I'll just wait here. There we go. Show my screen. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us on the webinar today. Um, again, my name is Lauren Long, and I work at NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, and I basically work on green infrastructure-related topics here. So I help uh, coastal communities basically implement green infrastructure to reduce their hazard risks and vulnerabilities. So I help develop different products and services for that to, to help support coastal communities. And then I also deliver a training where you know we talk about different practices and strategies and bring community, community members together to talk about those issues. And I'll let my colleague Tasha introduce herself. Hi, this is Tasha Allen. Thanks again for having us. I'm also with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, and Lauren and I are in Charleston, South Carolina, and it's um, extremely hot today, humid but sunny. Um, and I have been at the center for almost um, 20 years, and my focus area is working with communities to conduct risk and vulnerability assessments. And over the past five years, I've gotten more involved in looking at green infrastructure and how that can help communities reduce some of those, those impacts from, from flooding. And um, I do a lot of more community-based work, so 
more on the groundwork, helping communities work through some of these processes, and then what we do is take those experiences and try to figure out how we can share those with other communities. So thanks again, and we're looking forward to talking with you guys today. Great, thanks, Tasha. So like all of you are aware, communities have limited budgets. They need to prioritize options for addressing flood hazards and understand the cost of those different options. And coastal green infrastructure is really an effective strategy for reducing impacts from storm surge, sea level rise, and precipitation. And it includes a variety of approaches across different scales. So today, Tasha and I are going to be talking about some of those green infrastructure approaches that you can take, and we'll be highlighting resources to help you be more strategic rather than opportunistic when it comes to implementing green infrastructure. So just a quick look at what we're going to cover during the webinar. We're going to provide some background information on green infrastructure practices specifically for resilience to coastal hazards. And then nested within that background information, we'll be highlighting and demonstrating some products we've developed that can help you, again, be more strategic in your green infrastructure work. And then we'll take questions at the end. So all of the products we're going to talk about can be are located on our Green Infrastructure Topics page that's found on our Digital Coast website. And, and Tasha will have this up later on in case you don't uh, get this URL written down right away. So I'm going to start off by defining green or natural infrastructure so that everyone's on the same page with, with how we're approaching it today. So in our office, we define green infrastructure as incorporating both the existing natural environment, so your existing wetlands, forests, beaches and dunes, as well as engineered systems that use vegetation and other materials to really mimic those natural processes, and this is usually in a more urban environment. And we see these approaches as really, be, really working together in an integrated network that benefits nature and people. And our focus is using green infrastructure to be more resilient to climate and hazard impacts by helping coastal communities protect those existing natural areas or recreate those processes. So given this definition, green or natural infrastructure, whatever you want to call it, uh, can be approached at multiple scales, from the larger landscape to the community in sight and then along the shoreline. And when you're thinking about larger landscape approaches, here we're really focusing on conserving large core areas of natural lands, working landscapes, and open spaces that are really connected and provide a wide range of benefits to people, including you know, storm buffering, storing floodwaters, and of course a lot of the other benefits you guys are aware of, uh, like water quality and recreation. And then the site approaches focus more on using or recreating those natural processes to manage stormwater runoff in a more urban context. So here we're thinking green roofs, trees, rain gardens, bioswales, those sorts of things. And then approaches along the shoreline are focused on wetland or dune preservation or restoration, um, as well as hybrid approaches that might help lessen erosion and buffer storm impacts. So of course the approach you choose is going to depend on the issues that you're addressing and at what scale you're working. And Tasha and I are going to be getting into a bit more detail on these practices as we move through the webinar. So why are people becoming more interested in green infrastructure? Well, all of you know that coastal communities face increasing risk from extreme coastal storms like Katrina and Sandy because of increasing populations and, of course, that associated built infrastructure in harm's way. Uh, these images here on the screen are from Superstorm Sandy. And in Sandy's wake, there's really been an increased awareness and public dialogue about the role natural features can play in buffering from storm impacts. So the first step you might want to take when you're thinking about using green infrastructure to address coastal hazards is to actually see where you're exposed to those hazards. This is going to help you think more about where you want to put green infrastructure and which techniques might be the best given the hazards you're experiencing and the location. You know, again, thinking if you're in an urban area or a more rural area. Uh, this screen grab is from a tool we developed a year or so ago called the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper. And the tool was developed to really help communities start conversations around flood exposure and potential solutions. 
there are four main sections of, of maps in the mapper. One just shows the flood hazards, and then three show societal infrastructure and ecosystem exposure to those flood hazards, where you can you know, overlay those different flood hazards and look at maps. The maps are available for every coastal county along the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico, with potential expansion to other areas that we're working on this year. And basically, when you get in there, you just select your county, you zoom in to your preferred extent, and then you can collect and save maps that you can either you know, share with others by printing them or sharing the unique URLs that are generated or adding them to presentations, those sorts of things. And the maps that are shown here on the screen are from the ecosystem section, showing wetlands in the dark green, other natural areas in open space in that lighter green, beaches and dunes and tan, which you really can't see too much of uh, because they're covered with the hazard layer, and then development in the dark gray, and then you also have the different flood hazards overlaid. So these maps can really help communities see where they might want to protect existing natural areas that buffer their development um, from storms, or where they might want to do some restoration or shoreline protection projects. Uh, to help them be more resilient to these different hazards. And we demonstrated this tool at an, at an APA webinar last year, so we're not going to provide a lot of detail on the tool, but we'll be happy to answer questions or provide demonstrations outside of today's webinar or pull it up at the end if we have time, if folks have questions about this tool. So now Tasha and I are going to provide a bit more detail on the green infrastructure approaches you can take at the landscape community and site scales and along the shoreline. And then again, nested within that information, we're going to highlight and demonstrate a few NOAA resources that might be helpful to all of you at those scales. So I mentioned that the primary green infrastructure technique you'd implement at the landscape scale would be landscape conservation. So when you're identifying and conserving green infrastructure at this scale, you really want to focus on large, healthy areas that are in close proximity to like habitats or landscapes and that can provide a connected landscape to really allow for movement between populations as well as migration due to sea level rise. So basically you want to identify high quality areas with minimal fragmentation and alteration because you know the healthier the landscape, the better the ecosystem is going to function and of course the more protective benefits that will be provided. And to help conservation planners incorporate climate change into conservation planning at this landscape scale, we developed this guide for considering climate change and coastal conservation. And all of you know that climate change is impacting coastal environments and how their conservation is approached. And in order to really protect that ecological integrity of coastal habitats over the long term, as well as preserve those protective benefits that they provide to communities, we need to incorporate climate information into, into conservation planning. So the guide was to, to help conservation practitioners accomplish this while also gaining easy access to key resources that will help them. And the guide focuses on conservation planning in a coastal environment. And it does draw from existing conservation planning guidelines. So if you are a conservation planner or work on that, you, you'll be familiar with some of the steps. And, but it also incorporates some of the newer climate adaptation resources. And we scoped this guide with on-the-ground practitioners along the way. And we heard from them that there's so much information out there around climate change and climate adaptation that it was really hard to know where to start and what resources to use. So they told us, you know, something that would be helpful for them is, you know, a resource that's more concise, provides updated information, and points to a few key resources, but not everything. So we took this information and we structured this guide in six iterative steps that you can see here on the left side of the screen. And each step includes an explanation of why you would do that step how you would do it, and then an annotated list of resources to help with that step. Each step also includes a conceptual model that you see here on the right side of the screen, um, or an example, that uses a scenario of reducing coastal flooding using natural areas. You can see that at the top. And this example is basically built on for each step, and the image that you see here on the screen is an example built out for one of the later steps in the guide. And since this guidance document um, provides information on how to do something, 
we're currently finishing up a more condensed and interactive online version that will basically briefly summarize each step in the guide and then point to a subset of what we think are the most useful resources. And it also provides a little bit more instruction on how to use the resource for the specific step. So that online shorter version um, is going to be available within the next month on our Digital Coast website and it's going to point to this uh, full guide if folks want additional information. And then to take a step past conservation planning and into prioritization of conservation areas that really consider hazards and climate change, we've developed the Green Infrastructure Mapping Guide. And I'm going to actually open this up and demonstrate this. So this, on, this guide is basically an online tutorial that helps organizations conserve areas based on their goals that will get them the most bang for their buck. So I'm going to go ahead and open this on our Digital Coast website. So you should be viewing the launch page of the Green Infrastructure Mapping Guide. So this, again, it's a self-guided, self-paced tutorial, and the rest of the info that's on this page I'll be covering in the demo. So I'll just go ahead and launch here from the right side of the screen. So this was developed specifically for spatial analysts. And the focus of this product is really mapping green infrastructure for resilience to coastal hazards. And the guide specifically helps a spatial analyst create a GIS work plan that allows them to rank and prioritize green infrastructure for their study area using GIS. And the graphic on the right side of the screen can help you understand a bit more the general mapping approach that we take here in this guide. Um, it's basically a multi-criteria analysis that eventually leads to a prioritization of areas. So basically you're analyzing multiple data sets for characteristics of protective green infrastructure and then conducting analysis based on criteria you've developed, which we'll get into, and then calculating uh, cumulative results for a final layer that shows priority areas based on the ranks you've assigned. Again, I'll kind of go over those individual steps. And the, some different features in the guide include a GIS work plan layout and a work plan, you know, as defined in this tutorial, this guide, is basically a document that outlines the full details of GIS work to be performed. And then this also includes case studies and detailed guidance for each step along the way. It includes worksheets and templates that can be downloaded and accessed, to, you know, to related resource, resources. We also point to a short video that talks about um, how green infrastructure can protect gray infrastructure from storm impacts. And we'll be pointing this out, you know, Tasha will be showing this or talking a little bit more about this at the end of the webinar, but this is in here in the Green Infrastructure Mapping Guide for those spatial analysts who might not have that green infrastructure background but are tasked with doing, you know, doing some type of GIS analysis related to it. So I'm going to go ahead and click Get Started. So now you're looking at the GIS work plan view that's going to provide guidance and different examples. So on the top you see there's different steps along the top and these are all clickable and they go on to the next page and I'll get into each of these. And then underneath each step you see grayed out text or grayed text which is which are different examples for each step and I'll get into some of those. So the first step is write your GIS goal. And so this is basically, this goal basically describes the spatial product you want to create and what it's going to show. So, for example, we, you know, we put an example of a goal in here, which is to create a spatial layer that locates and prioritizes healthy wetlands along the state's coast that can provide flood protection from hurricane storm surge. The next step is writing mapping objectives. So those mapping objectives are going to define the individual analyses that will contribute to that overall goal. So again, you see here we want to locate wetlands. We want to locate healthy wetlands. Um, we want to locate healthy wetlands within storm surge zones. So again, it breaks down that goal into uh, objectives you can use when you're doing some analysis. The third step is to assign spatial criteria. So this is really going to define the specific criteria or characteristics that you want to analyze for each objective. So again, it's helping narrow down from that broad objective of locating wetlands to saying, okay, we really want to locate all salt and freshwater wetland areas within 500 feet of another wetland area. So it's giving some more specific boundaries around that mapping objective. 
And then, you know, the fourth step is gather data. So, of course, we have to gather some data and assess that data in order to conduct the analysis. And this is going to be based, again, on that criteria. So here we're looking at land cover. You know, we need to look at land cover to see where those wetlands are. Step five is outlining analyses. So this is going to really summarize the specific GIS methods that you're going to be using. So, for example, for that first objective, we want to extract wetland classes within 500 feet of another wetland patch. It's going to really define what you're going to do in GIS. And then st step six is designating a scoring system. So, you know, each objective might not have the same rank. You know, some might be more important than others. So you have to define a scoring system that's going to help you weight those different objectives and come out in the end with a priori priority areas that really help meet your goal. So I'm going to go into just a few of these individual steps to see, to show you what they look like. So we'll go into write GIS goal. So if I click on that, I get to a page that gives me a little bit more guidance. It gives me that, you know, an example, again, of a GIS goal. There's um, three buttons at the bottom here. If you click on step guidance, it's going to take you to a little bit more information if you didn't get enough from that first page. There's different resources and worksheets that you can use along the way. So these are just, you know, documents that can help you actually fill in your goal and fill in your objectives and kind of guide you through that process. And then there's case studies for each step. So some of the different case studies we have in here, we have one on mapping wetland adaptation areas for sea level rise in Maryland. We have another one for identifying green infrastructure in New York for protection. We have another one on prioritizing wetlands for protection in New York and Connecticut. And all of these case studies have details that correspond with the step you're on. So if I were to click on the Maryland case study, it's only going to provide me information on identifying a GIS goal. It's going to tell me what their GIS goal was and give me a little bit of background. But it's not going to go any further than that because I'm in step one. Same with all the other case studies. We're just going to be looking at the goal because that's the step that we're in. Of course, if we want to see the whole case study, we can always download it here at any time. And then now you can navigate using these two arrows at the top to the next step. So if I want to go to step two, write mapping objectives, again, I'm going to see that example information. I'm going to see those or the guidance, I'm going to see the example information. Again, I'm going to see worksheets and resources, case studies. Again, those case studies are only going to give me information associated with the steps. So here I'm just looking at Maryland's mapping objectives that they identified. And then here's just to give you one more, one more look. Step three, assign spatial criteria. Again, same deal. We have guidance and then some specific examples. And then um, here we have some questions to of course, some of this criteria is going to be based on expert opinion or expert knowledge. So here we, you know, give you some information on who you should ask for that information and what types of questions do you need to ask in order to get what you need to do your spatial analysis. And then again, case studies just showing mapping objectives for each of those case studies. And again, like I mentioned, if you want the full case study, um, you know, those, those are all available just by clicking right here. And then um, to navigate further, you can always go back to the menu and go to the intro, the work plan, the steps, the full case studies. And then all the resources that are located in this tutorial are, are right here. So you can get all those templates. You can get a GIS work plan template. And what that looks like is, you know, basically it's just going to be a blank template that you can fill in along the way. You can get an example project work plan, which is one filled out with that example that we included throughout the, the tutorial. You, know, you can get a data resource inventory where you can look at different um, data sets you want to include and the relevance for green infrastructure. So all of the information is in there. And you can also get, of course, the case studies. You can get the information if you want to download the full case, then you can get their GIS work plan. So you can see how did Maryland fill out their whole GIS work plan for mapping priority, conservation priorities for sea level rise adaptation. So you can see examples so that you can kind of use what other people came up with too. What kind of criteria did they come up with and those sorts of things. So with that, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint.
and I'm actually going to hand it over to Tasha to talk about some more community and site approaches that you'd implement in a more urban area. And I'll encourage people to start um, entering their questions in the question box so we can take them uh, later on. All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, so as Lauren mentioned in the introduction, green infrastructure approaches can also be applied at the community and site scale. And these are called low impact development practices and they are designed to mimic the natural hydrological processes so uh, by collecting and treating rainwater where it falls and rainwater is treated as an asset instead of a waste product and there are many different types of low impact development practices however the ones listed on the screen here are the most frequently used ones and so that's you know bioretention uh, roofing systems such as green roof and blue roofs, and also uh, per permeable pavements. And so with bioretention, you're capturing and filtering rainwater through vegetation and soil. And then from there, the water is often left to infiltrate into the groundwater. And then in urban settings where bioretention projects exist, um, the water, the excess water is usually captured through subdrains and then placed into the um, stormwater system. And some examples of bioretention include rain gardens, bioswales, and stormwater planters. And bioretention is really an actually popular approach. We were just talking about this with Ben, how people instantly think of, of rain gardens. But what's really nice is that bioretention is being used in a lot of different um, areas. And it's something that can be done at all different scales from the property owner all the way up to the municipality level. And some examples of uh, that I'm familiar with, there are a lot of examples that where people are using this more extensively are in Milwaukee, Rochester, New York, and Charleston, South Carolina. So they have some good, good examples of the many applications of bioretention to reduce uh, stormwater impacts. Green roofs uh, capture and store rainwater and reduce the heat generated from rooftops. And depending upon their design, they um, can reduce the flow of stormwater from roof by up to 65%, and then they can also delay the flow rate by up to uh, three hours. And again, that just depends on the design. And there's actually two different types of roofing systems that uh, store and also um, help evaporate the water, and that's the green roofs. And that's the example you see on the slide here, where they use uh, vegetation and different um, layers of vegetation and possibly um, some other kind of synthetic materials to help the water, uh, capture that water and detain that. And then there's also um, a, a type of roofing system called blue roofs. And what those do is they actually detain water in trays and sometimes the trays are filled with gravel and then some sort of geosynthetic material. And what that does is it helps slow the release of, of the water on the roofs and then also some of the water evaporates off. And then usually the water that is released off the roof goes directly into some type of um, either a, a rain garden or some other type of bioretention system or a cistern. And then sometimes these, um, these blue roofs actually have roof drains or there's permeable material in that um, in those um, trays, and then sometimes there's little holes in the trays. So they can be designed different different ways depending upon what your goal is and how much water you would like to capture. And uh, green roofs are more prevalent, and there are a lot of major cities that actually use these. And folks are probably familiar more familiar with them with New York uses green roofs, Philadelphia. Um, but there's even smaller communities such as Duluth, Minnesota that has a church with a green roof on that. So we learned about that in one of our projects in, in Duluth. So it does have, lots of times it's in more of the urban environment, um, but there are uh, areas, smaller communities that are able to do that. And this is actually an example in South Carolina in, in this slide. And then permeable pavements, they allow rainwater to drain directly through them. And I don't know if you've ever seen a, um, it's a really neat demonstration. Somebody will have a sample of a permeable pavement and they'll pour a glass of water and it just soaks all the way through and it comes out the bottom. But usually for, for parking lots and, and roads and alleyways, there's usually some sort of gravel sub base underneath and then there's some sort of um, under drain. And then these are, permeable pavements have traditionally been used uh, in parking lots and neighborhood roads since, that, since there is a lot of runoff generated 
from from those. But in um, but in this example here, this was at the University of Connecticut, um, where they they do a lot of uh, testing of different different types of um, low impact development techniques. And what's really neat about this is you can see that um, one side of the the dry side, the right-hand side of the uh, parking lot, has used a, a permeable asphalt, and so the rainwater it rained, and the rainwater has gone through, um, absorbed into the pavement. And then on the left-hand side, you see that it's still wet, and that's just um, quote regular as asphalt. So it's kind of neat to see that see that comparison. And um, a lot of communities are actually using. Um, are really starting to look at how to use the permeable asphalt and the, the concrete. We were visiting some communities in, in uh, the Rochester, New York area, and they are starting to use um, concrete, uh, permeable concrete, uh, to replace some of the sidewalks. And um, I just read about a study actually in uh, New York where it's the New York Department of Transportation partnered with an engineering firm called Barton and LeJudis, and they were installing and testing heavy-duty porous asphalt on Lake George, and that's a high tourist area. And so basically, it's a four-lane, about one and a half mile um, road that goes around Lake George. And so they're really trying to test out: um, can you have these high traffic areas, and can you use on these high traffic areas? Can you use um, a, a permeable pavement material and they found that the asphalt actually works better um, in that and then you know the project was just completed in 2015 so it's a new it's a new project but they say that it's been performing very well um, and because that's a lot of concerns I think from a lot of DOT staff is that you know the perceived uh, lack of long-term performance and maintenance information and so I think there's a lot of universities and DOTs that are actually experimenting with these permeable pavements. And then there's also the use of pavers, where you can do um, grass or gravel pavers or just um, some sort of per permeable concrete or material that you can have in your, own, um, in your own driveway or in your backyard as well. So again, there's that kind of um, homeowner homeowner um, application of this too. And I, a lot of communities are the way they're being strategic in this use is to look at um, when they're doing capital improvement planning and projects to incorporate lid practices into those um, activities. Green streets incorporate many of the low impact development techniques I just talked about and they do that in the transportation right of ways. And uh, these are some examples of a couple couple of green streets and Portland is most well known for their green street program and Chicago also has a uh, green alleys program as well so they've got a lot of urban environment and they've been able to incorporate these green streets into them and so although the design can, varies from place to place the goals are essentially the same as to provide stormwater management in the right of way um, and then to reduce that volume and provide these more environmentally and aesthetically um, enhanced road systems. And there's multiple benefits that these types of green systems or these, quote, living streets uh, provide. And mentioned, you know, they reduce flooding. They help filter pollutants out so they can help them, um, with the water quality aspect. Um, they decrease the amount of stormwater entering the um, sewer system, so that helps reduce the stressing on, on pumps and how much needs to be treated. And then they also provide a really, in some cases, um, a very nice aesthetic. Uh, it can help in, you know, increase property values. Um, it looks really nice. People want to be in that area. It can help reduce some of the um, heat island effect as, as well. And, um, you know, even though Portland and um, Chicago are larger cities and have large, you know, have larger budgets, um, smaller communities like one we visited in, in Brighton, New York, actually um, is using a green streets a approach. So there is definitely something that's that's doable. And again, it's thinking about where um, where you can incorporate these when you maybe ha are having to um, think about um, fixing your infrastructure because it ends up being a little bit, uh, less expensive instead of going in and just it in. So thinking about those capital improvement projects and how you incorporate into there. So communities are definitely becoming more interested in using low impact development approaches. And so a few years ago, we got a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, to help communities start answering questions like, 
what will flooding look like now in the future with uh, land use and precipitation changes? What will the impacts be if we continue to practice business as usual or do nothing? And you know, continue to, to develop like we've planned um, or not plan for those um, precipitation changes. What will flooding? Uh, what will the impacts be if we decide to do something, uh, imp possibly implement green infrastructure practices? And will that actually lower our flooding impacts? And then, what types of benefits and, and costs are associated with flooding and implementing a GI strategy? And so what we did was we worked with two communities, Duluth, Minnesota, and Toledo, Ohio, to begin to answer some of these questions and develop a methodology that could be shared with other communities. So this is really a proof of concept sort of project, is thinking about, you know, how do you go about, what are the steps to go about answering these questions? What types of models do you need? What types of data and information do you need? What does that engagement process look like? And so the result of, of those that two-year project is uh, we do have a technical report. It's a very detailed 200-page report um, that has all our, all our technical methodology in that, the case studies. But in case you're not, you, you don't have the time to read that, that very detailed large report, we've developed this guide to assessing green infrastructure costs and benefits for flood reduction. And what I want to do is, um, walk folks through this real quickly just to show you what's contained in this in this guide. So you can access that from our um, our Digital Coast um, website under the, the training section. And then what you do is you, um, this is in a PDF format, and so you get the PDF and this is actually the framework. So this is the six steps that we've identified for for folks to go through when they're thinking about assessing the um, green infrastructure uh, costs and benefits. And so as you can see, this six-step process, it goes into defining the flooding problem, assessing flooding scenarios without green infrastructure, identifying how a flood reduction target can be met um, using that green infrastructure, and then assessing what the flooding looks like with using green infrastructure, then estimating benefits and costs, and then uh, identifying communicating the desired uh, green infrastructure strategy based upon all, the, all that analysis. And then you can see that there's actually uh, um, subtasks underneath here and then what your output would be. And so what I'd like to do is just show you guys an example of, um, of what, you know, if you, as you dig into this guide, what, what's provided for you. So you have those, you have your main step, which is define the flood problem in step one. And then you've got these tasks here. Um, and then we have different you know, different types of t tips to help you get started. You know, what are the key questions that you need to cons consider? Um, what are your key considerations? What's the recommended expertise um, to help you in this step? And then as we dig into the tasks, um, this one, for example, is choose a watershed. What are some of the criteria for watershed selection? And this is all based upon working with those two communities and then also just different expertise and experiences in, in doing these types of projects. We have different tips that are there. Um, we also have, based upon the work that we did um, in Toledo and in Duluth, different examples from that. So we have these kind of mini case studies sprinkled throughout as well. Um, and so this is just kind of digs into sort of what is, what's it going to take and what are the steps and the types of information and data you um, need to consider in walking through this um, this six step process, and to also help um, help folks in this is that we have a data checklist, and what this does is it goes through each of those steps and identifies the type of data that are either required or optional. What optional means is nice to have it will enhance your assessment because this was a pretty data intensive process. As we got in, we realized we're like, oh wow, there's you know a lot of data and information that we need. And what we tr how we try to approach our projects is that we try to use as much freely available or locally available data so that um, there's not a lot of, um, we're trying to think about once we share this out and, and how communities need to use this is that they might not have the, the finances to be able to you know, create a bunch of new data or collect a bunch of new data. So we try to use what's, you know, what's available. Um, this, the purpose of this is really for that watershed kind of planning uh, approach. And so really thinking about, um, you know, if you're really interested in starting to put together a green infrastructure strategy, you know, what does that entail and what, what information do you need to consider and what are those steps? Another resource that goes along with this is, um, 
is that we developed this um, green infrastructure options to reduce flooding. And what this provides is, um, it goes into, and I'll just show you quickly, um, we have different green infrastructure practices, and these are predominantly the practices that were identified in our pilot projects with Toledo and Duluth, what they were interested in, so we highlight those. Um, and they're, they're predominantly low impact development practices. And then sort of, and then what you need to consider when you're when you're, think, when you're going through your planning and implementation phases. And then also, um, in our pilot projects, we were able to estimate um, storage potential and cost. And so that's by, um, by low impact development practice and then how much, what's the estimated cost of that storage. And so that's a really helpful piece out there. Um, and it's, um, it's something that you can go in and when you're thinking about developing your GI strategy, you can say, okay, well, if we're thinking about this, what is, you know, rough estimate of what that might cost us depending upon how much um, storage we need and how much of, of that uh, practice we'd like to implement. Okay. Let me go back to our presentation. So hopefully I think folks are seeing shoreline approaches uh, slide. And the last green infrastructure approach is called living shorelines. And living shorelines are traditionally used in low to medium energy shorelines. An example of natural shorelines, as Lauren mentioned in our introduction, these are naturally occurring uh, systems such as dunes and beaches, wetlands, um, oyster or coral reefs. And so these actually, you know, help reduce shoreline erosion, particularly in that lower energy environments. And then there's a lot of other benefits they, they provide, um, absorbing the wave energy, helping um, lessen some of the impacts, um, you know, increase infiltration. So from that hazards perspective, there are some, some benefits. And then you also get the other benefits for, for, the, um, for habitat, and then also the economics and the aesthetics as well for communities to have these things present. Another type of living shoreline is a hybrid approach. And these combine the natural and nature-based measures with structural measures. And these are typically implemented in more medium energy, riverine or estuarine or coastal environments. And they have, uh, they're able to dissipate wave energy with the, from the structural component that's part of that. And then there's also different natural benefits that they provide from the nature-based practices. So again, these are, um, they can really help with, um, with maintaining or restoring the natural habitat in the areas. They also help um, dissipate some of the wave energy, so it helps with erosion, with some of the impacts from, from uh, waves from storm surge. And typically, an you know, example of a hybrid materials include you have the natural vegetation, and then you'll have some sort of sand fill, some sort of uh, maybe a lower rope, low profile profile rock structures such as, um, you know, lower groins or some sort of living breakwater such as oyster reefs or oyster, oyster um, balls. And so you have these kind of this natural, again, with some of the, um, the structural practices. And there are actually several places that are using um, living shoreline techniques. It started out as trying to do, do smaller pilots and trying to figure out, okay, what's really going to work? What type of environments do these work in? And so some of the, the, one, the states that have been using them for, for the longest include New Jersey, Maryland, North Carolina, and Delaware. And then there's definitely some, some more pilots in uh, New York and in Connecticut. And then I've also heard that in some of the, um, in the Great Lakes, some of the smaller lakes, that they've been looking at um, living shoreline or nature-based shoreline approaches. And then um, there are um, a big issue with living shorelines is the permitting piece. And so uh, the problem was that these actually were not um, allowed to be done. And so what these uh, researchers um, and have been doing with the state agencies as they've been working with them to look at the permitting process and to actually change those. So those states that I mentioned, such as New Jersey, New York, Maryland, North Carolina, um, and Connecticut have been successful in changing the state permitting laws to allow for living shoreline ap approaches. Um, so those are great places to go to find, find information out. Um, and I know that the Great Lakes are definitely looking more into this and trying to figure out 
you know, what will work in, in the Great Lakes system as well. Um, and then there's, there's some um, good resources out there, such as folks are trying to think, figure out like which project is right for, for my site or the type of shoreline that I have. I know Connecticut's been working on a resource for that. And also uh, Virginia Institute of Marine Science has a decision tree for what to consider. So there's some different resources and Lauren and I can, can share, those, share those out. And I think that this sort of the takeaway with this is that like all other green infrastructure techniques, the specific technique chosen by a community is highly dependent upon the local conditions. So what is your environment? What type of problems are you trying to reduce or solve? And so really thinking, thinking through that. So there's not, you know, we talk about these in more generalities, but it really is some thinking that needs to go into, okay, which approach is really going to work for what I'm, what I'm trying, trying to do. Um, and then I, I think one of the benefits of, of looking at either natural shorelines or hybrid approaches um, to, to shoreline management is that um, these, these types of approaches are, um, are not fixed in place and they can, they can adapt to different condi conditions such as sea level rise. And um, there has been um, research that shows that natural and hybrid solutions uh, can be less expensive to maintain over the longer term um, as opposed to something like, like a bulkhead or, or a groin or something like that that are, not as, that are fixed in place and cannot be as adaptable to these changing conditions. So those are just some considerations, I think, and some, and some benefits to that approach. NOAA and the Army Corps of Engineers developed a brochure presenting a, uh, a continuum of green to gray shoreline stabilization techniques, and they highlight living shorelines as one of those techniques. And as you can see here, that's the front cover of this, and then what it does is this is a, a fold-out essentially brochure, and so what it does is you can see that continuum of those 19 different natural and structural practices for shoreland stabilization. And then it provides some basic information about uh, the environments that are best suitable for these, these types of approaches, the benefits, the disadvantages, uh, options for materials, and the relative cost for initial construction and, and maintenance. So this is a pretty handy if you're just getting in, into learning about natural structural shoreland stabilization. This is a great resource because it provides all that information. And then NOAA um, earlier this year re released a um, guidance for considering living shorelines. And so it goes into defining living shorelines, what NOAA's um, guiding principles are, and then some different um, conceptual framework for considering living shorelines and um, what are some of the policy considerations, and then what is NOAA's mandates and authorities and programs to help, su help support the use of living shorelines. And then the Corps of Engineers released, I think it was the end, last, sometime last year, maybe in the summer, they did uh, release their North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, and what this does is outlines different risk management strategies using both that structural and non-structural approaches. And this was a, a post-Superstorm uh, Sandy study, and it's really to help fill knowledge gaps and provide information to support the identification and evaluation and integra um, integration of, um, or integration, excuse me, of natural and nature-based features. And so they're really, as, as possible, uh, risk reduction um, risk reduction uh, measures as well. So those are a couple of resources that, that are available, some more information on, on the living shorelines piece. And another essential part of building a green infrastructure strategy is, is a stakeholder engagement process. And we have found that um, in all of our projects, we the more diverse uh, stakeholders we have, the stronger our projects are and the, and the more accepted they are and the stronger um, uh, more locally grounded, if you will, they are. And so we, our projects and our trainings, Lauren does our green infrastructure training, you know, we traditionally have folks from local, state, and federal government, nonprofits, HOAs, planners. So it's a host of people sitting together and working through and discussing these, these issues. And a tool that we really like to use is, um, is visualizations. It really can help people see what, you know, what is your current state or what is, you know, what does something look like now? And then what how could you maybe use some of these more natural or green infrastructure approaches to help maybe reduce some of those those hazards? And so, for example, here you'll see this this street here, and there's there's a, a lot of um, concrete and asphalt, and so there's a lot of probably runoff from this. And so they just did the simulated photo um, 
there's free software called Canvas that can help you go in and, and do these kind of before and then after, quote, after these simulated photos to see you know what the potential is. Some other examples that where Canvas has been used is they were looking at um, what a seawall would look like versus what a living shoreline would look like. So people can see those options and what might work for, for their community and the um, issues that they're dealing with. And Lauren mentioned this animation when she was going over the mapping guide, but we've developed a series of animations and one of them is focused on green infrastructure and the uh, protective services that, that it provides. And so uh, this is a quick five minute animation and it's really geared towards helping people understand how green infrastructure can pr um, help protect the built environment from storm surge. And so this is just a few more uh, clips from the animation uh, where you can actually see, you know, uh, when folks hear the word green infrastructure, what does that really look like in my community? And they say, oh yeah, I know where the oyster beds are, or oh yeah, I've seen, you know, sand dunes, or I know that that's a coral reef, and oh, I didn't realize it had the potential to help reduce some of these impacts and that they're important to my community. And then you can actually go in in the animation and learn more about these different features and, um, you know, how they're benefiting your community. And um, again, here's our website on the Digital Coast. It's under our topics page, and here's the URL. And so these, the resources that Lauren and I shared today and the, uh, a, a bunch of other resources we have are located on, on this website. And um, that actually concludes our, our sharing, and so I think we're ready to actually get into some questions here. And here's our contact information, too. Great, thanks a lot, Tasha. Uh, this is a, a terrific presentation. I, I have to tell you, I've been uh, looking at um, LID uh, uh, work for, for a long time. I started promoting it as a, a small town planner back in 2004 uh, here in New Hampshire. And it, it, the engineers even at that time were saying, well, we're, we're questioning what it is. Um, and I still find questions. Um, and a number of the questions we have from our participants deal with uh, issues on porous pavement. And uh, I, I, I chair my, my town's planning board. We're a town of about 3,000 people. And we got a proposal for a, um, a new state liquor store. And uh, it was a, a, a conceptual proposal. And I talked about you know, the possibility of um, doing something LID-ish. And uh, they said, yeah, we could do a rain garden. Uh, and I also talked about porous pavement. And the comment I got from the engineer was that he thought, and I want, want your observations on this, he thought that uh, porous pavement works well in situations where there's not a lot of traffic movement, such as uh, a place, an office parking lot where people will uh, drive in in the morning, leave their car there all day, and then drive away in the evening, as opposed to uh, a retail setting where there's a lot of constant flow of, of traffic and the turning of tires on the pavement. What he, what he observed was that it tends to break up the, um, the adhesion uh, that's, that's keeping the pavement together. And what if you could comment on that and, and where porous pavement is better or uh, better used? Yeah, so I'll caveat this is that I'm not an engineer or, you know, an expert in this, but um, am I. just some of, yeah, just some of the, and that is, I think that that is a common um, thinking is that, that it's a very delicate in some way um, product, um, some, you know, and we have seen in some of the, the communities that we've worked with where they do put it like at the city hall. And so, yes, the cars are parked there, um, or they'll put it kind of the periphery of, of the uh, parking lot, so as the water's running off. Um, but I know that there has, I mean, I think the um, University of New Hampshire um, Storm Center has been doing a lot of research, and I know a lot of the Department of Transportation are doing a lot of research to look at how do we strengthen the, the current pervious uh, pavement materials to, to be able to, um, to withstand some of those, those um, you know, that more use or that heavier traffic or, or that weight. And so I, I think that they're headed that way. And I think that there are, um, I'd have to do a little more research to see about, you know, have, have communities, you know, taken that leap and, and done that. But I was really interested in this, um, this New York uh, State Department of State project where they actually, it's a pretty high traffic, you know, tourist 
tourist area and it's like a, a one mile um, road where they actually have used this, you know, what they're calling this heavy um, porous asphalt. And so it is a very high, I guess, quote, um, traffic area. And it's, you know, and they just put it in so they, ha they don't have, you know, 10 years of information. But I think that with the research is definitely um, going, going that way because they know that people do need that information to know about the long-term performance and if people want to use it in those higher, higher areas. Lauren, do you know of any examples off the top of your head? Um, and I can definitely send folks more information. Yeah, I was just um, thinking about, you know, when, when I'm out doing, again, like Tasha, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not, um, I don't have any specific, like, yes, it works in high traffic environments, um, but when I'm out doing trainings, we, we hear a lot from local speakers about what they're using, like what different um, green infrastructure approaches that they're using and how they're working or not working and that sort of thing. And I've definitely heard speakers talk about implementing, you know, that they have implemented pervious pavement for actually pretty significant roadways because they're, they were really concerned off into the nearby stream and they were, they were, you know, they were not fulfilling their, their discharge requirements or their TMDL. So they were really concerned about runoff and they implemented it and it was working great. So I don't know if it, it probably depends on the material that you use and it probably depends on the maintenance. I know you have to sweep pervious pavements uh, fairly. I, I don't know how frequently, I'm thinking like quarterly is what I heard recently, that you have to sweep them and you have to keep obviously sand and debris off of them, otherwise they become impervious, of course, if they get more compact. But I did, I do remember a speaker specifically saying that it was working well on their roadways and it was actually, they were in a colder area and they were experiencing uh, less of a need to use salt to because the road actually was just staying warmer in general and it wasn't freezing. So they were having to use less salt, which was also impacting water quality in the nearby stream where the chemicals and the salt that they put on the pavement. So I'm not, I don't know exactly for sure, but I think it probably depends on the material. And again, like Tasha mentioned, people are doing more research and figuring out the best way to make that possible. Um, and I know, you know, the Department of Transportation is right now looking at their funding, they have a funding announcement out right now, it might be closed, I'm not sure if it's closed yet, but they're looking at different pilot projects to think more about using green infrastructure for transportation related issues. And so they're kind of trying to test some of that stuff as well. And I know as far as pervious pavers, like in an alleyway, um, I live in a low impact development neighborhood. And in the, our back alleyways, which is where all of our traffic really goes because that's where we all park and that we drive through there every day. And they're pavers with gravel in between and um, they seem to work just fine. And we drive over them all the time. So it just probably depends. If it's a smaller parking lot, maybe um, doing more of the paver approach would be would be more sustainable than than a pavement. People were worried about cars moving in and out too much. And I, I think one other important point is the um, a lot of well we what we've seen in some of the communities we worked with is that some of the municipal government uh, departments are wanting to to learn how to do these approaches and install them themselves. And so the proper training is really important. We were in Rochester, New York. Uh, last summer and they were giving us tour of all their different green infrastructure projects and they showed us in one of their, their parking areas where um, something hadn't been properly installed it was um, a, a porous asphalt and so they said you know we think it was probably that they didn't let it sit long enough the the staff had just learned how to use it so I think getting that that proper training is is really important and learning that learning the techniques as, as well as more communities maybe start to think about how they can implement it as opposed to possibly working with a private engineering firm. Great. Um, we, we have a bunch of comments and questions, uh, and I do want to share this one in particular with you. Uh, it's uh, from this is from David. Great resource, well spent federal dollars. That's uh, that's good to hear. Um, he also points out, and, and I think it was uh, I can't remember if it was Tasha or Lauren. You you pointed out the you mentioned the UNH uh, stormwater center. I, I encourage people to uh, Google that and look up their research. They've been doing uh, you know, cold weather LID research for a number of years and have some really interesting results. Um, 
point uh, raised by Ned about freeze-thaw action. Uh, he says there's also a problem with freeze-thaw action in cold regions. In cold regions, even shaded areas can, can be a problem as a result of, of freeze-thaw action. So the inability of, of porous pavement to thaw out in the sunshine. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is Lauren. I don't, um, I don't have a lot of uh, information necessarily to provide on that. Like I, you know, I've heard, you know, I've heard that it can actually create less ice by using pervious pavements. But yeah, there's also then the possibility of, you know, since you have less compact material, you get water in there and then it freezes. So does it take longer to thaw? I'm not exactly if it does actually freeze, and I'm not exactly sure on that. Um, I would say like you mentioned, Ben, that the UNH Stormwater Center probably has informa a little bit more information on using that type of material in a colder environment. Yeah, they so actually... I would suggest maybe going there. Maybe Tasha has something to add. Yeah, they have some... They, they actually have a lot of studies and research that's been done. And actually, I was just reading a paper on the freeze and, and thaw. I can share that... Um, that with you because it's the research, I think it's the Federal Highway Department that's been doing or the administration that's been doing that research um, and how they've been looking at how to strengthen that and using, um, again, I'm not an engineer so I'm, I'm learning as well some of these practices, but looking at a type of cellulose type of material. So I, I know there's a lot of research being done that UNH um, Stormwater Center, they have a lot of the articles are really easy to find. So they're definitely looking at that since they are in the, in the Northeast, so they're definitely looking at those colder climate conditions as well, um, and then how you act properly maintain them, um, you know, using salt, don't scrape, th things like that. So def there's definitely a lot of information out there too. But I would start with that site specifically. Okay, we do have some questions about maintenance, um, and uh, from, from you know, I'm trying to merge these questions into kind of a, a comprehensive uh, question statement for you. Uh, one person is asking about uh, tips or case studies or preferred brands of, of pavement and installation to ensure long-term functionality. Um, another one is asking, well, how, how do you maintain it? And, we've, uh, and you talked a little bit about vacuuming, and uh, so following on that is, is there, does, it, does the maintenance require special equipment, uh, special sorts of vacuums that vacuum pavement? I know from the Rochester, when we talked to Rochester folks, is that they were able to use their, I think I'm remembering this right, they were able to use their existing um, street cleaning equipment, um, but I know that there is special equipment out there, um, the sweeping and the, and the, main, the maintaining, um, and I think it depends on how much use that actual um, you know, asphalt or the concrete act actually gets. Um, we we don't know where since we're the federal government we don't we're not allowed to say you know which which company you should go with or that sort of thing on on products right. so that would have to be I would go to the UNH Stormwater Center or you know do a Google search or look for some case studies um, but I mean you definitely need need to maintain it but from from I don't know Lauren if you got some examples I've heard that it's it's not that um, you have to be mindful of it and make sure it doesn't get clogged so that it can do what it needs to, needs to do and one interesting we thing we heard was that in the city hall parking lot that had the um, porous asphalt, they actually had um, an area for snow, so where they plowed, they plowed the parking lot in the snow, and that was actually just regular asphalt they used there because of some of the weight of the snow, and then what that did is they had curb cuts, and that snow melt would drain into um, a, uh, a really large kind of bioswale rain garden area. Um, so that they um, so they had both in in their their parking lot. Lauren, I don't know if you've heard other examples of um, the specific maintenance requirements. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure if you have to have a special vacuum, but um, I know that folks that have talked at the trainings and that have implemented the pervious pavement or the pervious pavements, they've mainly just been vacuuming. That was that's been mainly been the the maintenance that they've been doing, and they. And the recently, I talked to someone and who was presenting and asked them 
it, you know, if it was if it was costing them more money to, to maintain it, or if it seemed about the same as their, you know, regular maintenance was initially on the regular pavement, and you know, they told me that it was about the same. Like they were just they, you know, nor normally they would quarterly go out and maintain their regular pavements. They said now we don't have to repair cracks and that sort of thing. We're just really sweeping it. So he said at this point there hasn't really been any change in cost as far as maintenance goes and that's kind of been the the gist of their maintenance and I know you have to remove you have some kind of drain in place near the pavement you have to remove debris and leaves and that sort of thing make sure it doesn't get clogged so the main thing is just make sure it doesn't get clogged because then it becomes you know impervious at that point I know that in our neighborhood we mainly just sweep um, not often enough, I would say, but we should be sweeping more because I do notice things compacting a little bit, but um, that's just something, you know, picking the weeds out, you know, if, the, if weeds start growing through and then also sweeping it. Okay, we do have a, a, a number of different comments about um, the freeze-thaw action. I'll, I'll just uh, summarize this and say um, it's a, a work in progress. <laughs> um, we have a different sort of question here, and this kind of relates to um, green infrastructure and bioswales and rain gardens, um, and and it it, it focuses on. Um, let's see if I can find it now. The uh, here it is. Um, is there any research showing a connection between green infrastructure and mosquitoes? It seems potentially problematic as a vector for disease like Zika, bird flu, malaria, etc. This is Lauren, and I would say I don't know much about research on mosquitoes, but I do know that the idea behind green infrastructure is not to let water pond and sit there. Um, so I don't think it would be a problem. You know, I like I said, you know, I have bioswells in front of my house, and even during our crazy, you know, historic flood last October where those things were filled to the brim, um, they drained very quickly and we had no issues with increased mosquitoes or anything like that. So I think, you know, these practices are designed to have drains in them. So they're not just um, a vegetated ditch really, you know, it's a, it's a vegetated swale that has gravel in it and also has a drain underneath or a drain within it too. So if it reaches a certain height, the water then starts draining into the storm sewer system. Um, and it also, there's drains underneath that then drain it to other areas, like a you know restored wetland area and then out to a waterway. So they're really designed to flow water through and not have it be stagnant. So I don't see any issues with mosquitoes personally, but maybe we need to do more research on that. I don't know, Tasha, if you have anything to add. Well, it's, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's just that um, they're not meant to let water pond. You know, it's just to kind of slow down, slow down water and temporarily um, store it. But they do drain really well. And you know, it all depends on your design too. I mean, the important thing is, like I said earlier, was proper installation and proper techniques. Um, and there's a there's a lot of resources uh, for homeowners out there that want to put in rain gardens. And I know a lot of extension agents actually provide rain garden work. You know workshops to show people how to do that. There's different manuals. Again, but it's again, the people that are installing these systems really need to know how to properly do that and then connect it to the, the stormwater systems. Well, it, along that line, I, I have to wonder if, in fact, uh, rain gardens and bioswales might actually reduce uh, the prevalence of mosquitoes, given that uh, detention basins will tend to hold water for a while. And the focus uh, in in uh, rain gardens and, and bioswales is is as much on the vegetation to take up the water as it is in in uh, slowing it down and, and sinking it into the ground. Uh, but that's an interesting question. Um, here's a question from Sean. Uh, the type of analysis envisioned by the green the guide to assessing green infrastructure costs and benefits seems like a heavy lift for most small communities, and he puts in parens under ten thousand. Can the green infrastructure options be used as a sort of a shortcut to determine the level of benefit and cost for a given type of green infrastructure? Yes, yeah, so that is actually some really good good feedback, and we have been hearing that. Is it? It is a very. Um, it is. I will admit, you know, going through. We went through a two-year project, and we had funding, and we had a, um, a lot of quote, partners and friends that did did a lot of kind of that in-kind support. You know, basically donating their time to do some of the 
hydrologic modeling and doing some of the damage assessment. Um, we did use freely available tools, but that doesn't mean that maybe you're going to have the staff time to do that. Um, I think what I would recommend is is taking a look at the guide, seeing what you, you do have available. I mean, you can definitely look at the strategies that are there. I think a lot of communities, instead of mapping out all their hydrology and doing all this technical mapping, and as, as they do a lot of, um, they, they're opportunistic. I know you're talking about going from opportunistic to strategic, but a lot of people don't go right to strategic to, to in the real world. It's looking for those opportunities where um, I was driving along with the stormwater manager and he's constantly looking for places to store stormwater and this doesn't have to be anything you know fancy essentially and so I think it's a lot of communities have started out with looking for opportunities to put possibly a, a you know a veget you know bioswale or rain garden or you know where's a place where they're going to have to repave the road and you know do some other infrastructure maintenance so maybe we'll do you know, some uh, porous asphalt or they're having big st uh, flooding problems. And so it's, it's really looking at that. So I think I, I just encourage folks to take a look at what's available. Also, universities are really good partners. And they, they lots of times are looking for projects or experiences to do some of that, that modeling or to do some of the research. We found that, you know, some of the communities we worked with work with universities. Um, and then there is some stuff that the Corps of Engineers will do along with hydrologic modeling and, you know, NOAA provides some different climate data and there's different universities that have different climate climate information as well. Um, but it can definitely be a very daunting task. Um, and so in some ways you do just need to look at what's what opportunities are, are available. Um, but I think that that guide's nice. It, it steps out what you need to do and in some cases you might have already um, done some of that some of that work so you can build upon that and start looking at where are places where we could do storage or you know what are we interested in in doing or where can we test out some of these these techniques and uh, yeah go ahead I was just gonna see if Lauren had anything she wanted to add to that um, I was just going to agree that you that you know if you can't do the modeling you probably already know where you have issues you know you live in a community you're working in that community and you know where there's issues and one of our local speakers in Delaware recently talked about they had a road that was flooding all the time and they had to do something about it and they were already going to be doing some improvements with the drainage and so they you know looked underneath there and they looked at you know what size they did do some modeling to see what size of piping they were going to need to put in in order to deal with the increased rain events they were seeing and you know then they looked at how much that increase in piping was going to cost versus what if we do a smaller pipe and add some green infrastructure some different vegetated rain gardens and swales and those sorts of things that could help help out they ended up going that route because it was going to be cheaper and they actually ended up getting a grant to install the green infrastructure piece so it helped with their cost savings and you know now that it's been fine they haven't had any flooding since it happened so they just did it you know kind of based on their experiences they were noticing a lot of flooding in the area but then they did do a little bit of modeling to look at you know how much they wanted to store um, in the end but I think it was on a much smaller scale than maybe the guide is that we talked about but I think it could help you step you through the process and you might end up skipping a couple steps and then going to another one but I think the green infrastructure options that kind of quick reference um, document can help you just be thinking about what you might want to implement, even if you don't go through the whole process. Tasha, you had mentioned um, you know working cooperatively with uh, a local university. So we have a comment here from Sandra. Um, she says, as a municipal example for bioswales and pervious pavement, check with the city of Aiken, South Carolina. That's A I K E N. They have installed and scientifically monitored the results in cooperation with Clemson University. So thank you for that comment. And we also we have a comment from someone else that uh, has heard that Chicago has begun vacuuming its, uh, its pervious pavement. Um, here's a question from Leslie. Are there any good guidelines for individual homeowners or homeowner associations to maintaining rain gardens? This is Lauren, and I know that there are there are different manuals out there for different states. Like I know in South Carolina here, we have a, a state low impact development manual where it talks about maintaining different structures. And I'm sure I know that other states have them too. 
So I think there are specific guidelines kind of in those different manuals, and I think a lot of them are probably could work in any state. So I don't, even though it's some of them are specific to a certain state, I think they're kind of just general guide, guidelines on maintenance um, and how to install them. So I don't, I don't know if there's just like a one one place I would send you, but I could send a the manual that we have in South Carolina. Mainly, it's just thinking about native vegetation, making sure your structure is you know, curved in versus out, because um, you want the water to flow into the structure, um, and probably different, you know, placement along the slope of the property. So some of that, you know, would be in those different manuals, but I don't have like one spot that I think is like a national resource that would tell you about, um, you know, HOA installing rain gardens. But I know there's a lot of different tips, tip sheets out there and guidelines and those sorts of things. Um, I don't know, Tasha, if you know about something specific. I'm guessing an HOA could pull information out specifically for their community out of some of those guides if they wanted to yeah. give homeowners um, guidance that they. No, it seems like it seems like every state does their own, um, and that's part of the challenge I think for people. There's so much information out there, but it's trying to find it. So I think like we could we could find a few and share with you, and then I I, I don't know if folks are familiar with sea grants and with you know land grants or ext extension agents um, some of those are, are associated with different state programs or you know soil and water conservation districts uh, you can google a lot of those and Lorna are more than happy to share the ones that you know different ones that we have found as as well um, but those are some of the, the so those are some of the groups or organizations that produce those those types of information like rain garden installation for homeowners Right, and I, I and guess you, I'll just real quickly add that if you are near, if you are nearby a national estuarine research reserve, a lot of times they have trainings on installing rain, or, or, on building rain gardens. So they have community workshops all the time. So if you're near one of those, um, I would encourage you to maybe contact that reserve and ask when their next workshop is, because a lot of them do go into detail about how to install them and give instructions and that sort of thing. Our HOA that, where I live, tell they tell us not to touch anything. So they, I guess not, nothing that we, I guess we're allowed to maintain anything we put on our property, but anything that's in kind of the public right of way, they tell us just to leave alone and leave it up to them to get someone to maintain it properly. But, you know, a rain garden is essentially a garden. So people that's, maintain that's it. That's pretty funny. That's one of the reasons why I live on 11 acres in the woods. Um, I, um, I, I think that the point about, um, uh, the, the use, choosing proper species is is really important, you know, and it's based upon you know, your climatic regime. So make sure you're choosing uh, species that are appropriate for your uh, your your USDA uh, zone, um, because I think a lot of the the early work that was done on LID was was done down in Maryland and up here in New Hampshire. Uh, and in other northern climates, it, the species that they chose wouldn't have been appropriate. Um, and so we do have some some questions from people about you know uh, recommendations on on uh, uh, green infrastructure resources for northern communities. And I, I think your uh, points about looking to uh, local resources is is helpful. Um, we do have a, a question here about cost analyses, and this is from Mark. Do you have any examples of actual benefit, cost, and advantages of using green infrastructure compared to conventional engineering and architectural projects. He says, sometimes it's a challenge to convince project managers, designers, engineers, and architects to consider using GI and examples of benefit cost information along with advocating that environmental benefits would help. There's a, and I'll let Lauren also chime in. There's there's one example I've seen, and Lauren actually someone um, spoke, I think talked about this in one of your trainings, what I think is called um, forging the link and it does have some pilots it has some examples of actual um, neighborhoods that have um, compared taking a uh, green infrastructure approach conservation approach and compared that to conventional approaches um, and so they actually do like the cost breakdown um, we found and there's I know there's a lot of, there's a research out there, but there are a lot of examples. EPA also has some examples. Again, that's kind of the problem is there's a lot of stuff out there, but it's trying to figure that out and like where navigate and figure that out. And it, if it's okay, Ben, I don't know, you know, traditionally what you do, but, you know, we're sharing a lot of resources here, so I don't know if it would help for us to send something 
or send something to you that you could share out with folks. I don't sure, know how that'd you guys be fine. Do that. Yeah, we, um, what we could do is uh, put, um, if you want to compile some links in a document, we could put that in accompaniment with uh, the PowerPoint presentation online. Another, another thing we found in the, in the Toledo and Duluth work that we did is that you didn't start seeing, at least the at least analysis we did, and we didn't have all the information on what the community is spending on flooding and stormwater repairs and um, all the impacts to, to structures, but we found that the, the longer you go out, um, the more benefit you're actually going to see. So if you did a 20-year analysis, you're probably not going to see that uh, return on your investment, but if you were to look out like 50 years, and so looking at at a green infrastructure that has a longer um, life cycle, that you start seeing an actual benefit um, from that um, from your damages avoided. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you have some specific resources as well. Yeah, I just I don't know if you guys just saw the link I put in the chat, but I did recently run across these EPA MythBusters, which I thought were really cool. They're just short, like two-page documents, and they're around all sorts of different, you know, barriers people have. Like people think they're too expensive, or they're too costly to maintain, or they're not going to look pretty, and that sort of thing. And I sent the link in the email or in the chat, but. Um, they do have one specifically on some quick examples of how people have saved money and um, and and why they've saved money. So they have different you know different benefits like you know you can save money by reducing the amount of pavement and curbs and gutters that you install by putting in the green infrastructure, which can be cheaper. Um, you know if you keep if you preserve existing trees, you don't have to plant new ones in a development. So that's a cost savings. Um, so a lot of the things that are required by developers already, they can eliminate doing some of those things if they put in green infrastructure, because um, it's all you know around stormwater runoff and detention. Um, and then they have in some of these, they also have you know examples of how people have saved money. Like they have an example in the MythBuster around cost. Um, example of like site preparation for a construction site, um, how much that would cost in a conventional development versus how much it cost them when they did it in a LID environment and then how much they saved. Same with stormwater management, you know, they have to do that anyway when they're thinking about development. So how much would it have cost to do conventional, then how much did it cost for LID and how much were the dollars saved? Same, same with landscaping. So this was kind of broken down for a, an area in Illinois and, and a project, and they ended up saving a lot of money. You know, they ended up saving, you know, I guess $500,000, which in the whole scheme of things isn't probably a ton, but it was cost saving. So they do have some of these great myth busters. So if you're talking to folks and you need to convince them, they've really looked at a lot of different barriers and uh, thought about quick snippets of statistics and information that you can provide to people to help them understand the benefits. Thanks, Lauren. I, I just uh, sent that link out to the entire audience in the chat box, so folks, you can look for that there. You might need to edit the link because it looks like it captured a semicolon, um, but uh, that's the, the, the text of the link. Um, we have a question here. Um, let's see how it's moved around, so I've got to go find it again. It's about advocacy. Uh, oh yeah, this here it is uh, from David. Most regulations encourage green infrastructure but do not require it. Do you have any advice or examples of overcoming resistance, particularly uh, primarily from developing community on green infrastructure? So I'm not sure if you're thinking about maybe incentivizing um, because yeah, if it's not required then they probably are just going to do what's, what they've always done. So it's probably more of a how do you incentivize implementing green infrastructure versus traditional development. And you know, I know a lot of people have done different things like um, some areas have a stormwater fee and they've you know, gone, done away with it if you have um, or, or reduced your fee if you have low impact development. Um, for some big developers, you know, if they want to get through the permitting processes, some communities expedite that and remove and waive all the fees um, associated with permitting. Um, so those are a couple of things people have done to kind of incentivize people doing this. And also, you know, telling them that, hey, if you do, if you do some of this low impact development, you can actually, and you put, you know, homes maybe closer together, you can actually sell more 
homes on that property than you would have done traditionally. Um, so there's some different things, some different incentives for a developer to, to think about doing that. But I think the community kind of has to come up with um, some of the incentives that they're willing to to implement. And the permitting one was the biggest, the one, the most common one that I've heard, just expediting and waiving the fee. I don't know. Well, money does talk. Um, here's a, a question from William. Um, what are you doing to introduce these concepts into DOT approaches? And I'm, not, I'm assuming he's talking about state DOT. Uh, it, he says, in Florida, FDOT only knows how to design ponds and swales, uh, which are only viewed as transport mechanisms. Well, um, this is Lauren, and I mentioned earlier that you know, we, I recently did a webinar for the U.S. Department of Transportation, but it was, it was in support of their new grant announcement for funding some of those green infrastructure pilot projects that could help protect uh, transportation infrastructure. So, of course, that's like kind of the approach they're looking at is how can I protect existing infrastructure that we have. And um, so they, on those webinars, there were a lot of, there were folks from um, many state depart, you know, departments of transportation on those calls because they wanted to hear about the funding. Um, and they also, you know, then they got a little bit of information on green infrastructure as well. So I think that's one way that I think the word is getting out to DOT. And I know that they plan on taking those pilot projects and developing guidance for state DOTs and what they want to see them do doing with their transportation infrastructure. So I think they're moving in a very positive direction as far as, um, you know, getting more resources in, in the hands of state DOT staff. And I know when I do different green infrastructure trainings, you know, I do those across the United States and we have DOT staff many times show up. Um, I know that we, you know, in the one I just did in Delaware, we had probably four DOT staff and then one that we just did in Oregon, we had several Oregon State DOT staff that have fall, since followed up with, with us on different ideas for projects and those sorts of things. So that's another kind of way we're getting out there is um, through our trainings and then um, working with directly with uh, the U.S. DOT. Yeah, and a couple things that come to mind is that we have recently, NOAA has recently um, provided grants, community resilience grants, and so we're doing several projects, that uh, pilot projects, that are um, going to be looking at green infrastructure and incentives and using capital improvement projects. And so I know that there's been um, thinking about who they um, involve in those projects, and so having DOT participants uh, be part of those projects as part of um, the stakeholder team. And then also a project that I'm working in in uh, Rochester, New York, we're looking at um, green infrastructure design standards for retrofitting. And so we actually have a work session coming up in July to facilitate the discussions of what, what needs to be included in those design standards, and we actually have DOT staff there participating, and so it's it's what has been nice is that the county we're working with, Monroe County, they actually know some people that work at the DOT and they have a relationship with them. And so they've asked, let them know what we're doing and to participate in this. And then um, I know that at least in New York State, they have um, green infrastructure design standards for new development. And I know that they've been trying to work a lot more closely with DOT staff to, to look at that you know, that information. So I think, again, it's just trying to get those folks and more involved in these, these processes and reaching out and continuing to, to tag them to be part of these projects. And I, I suspect wherever possible, um, and, and you can conclusively demonstrate it, uh, showing that LID techniques can actually be a cost saver. Uh, that That is important for everyone. We have uh, another um, uh, Recommendation here, this is from David. He says, in Pima County, Arizona, we created zoning code provisions for both rainwater and stormwater harvesting, as well as green roofs. So that's a great reference for a uh, dry weather climate. Um, uh, a comment from Kay, and this, is, this gets back to rain gardens. Um, and she says, what you should talk about is to monitor plant death and quickly replace dead rain garden plants, then remove annual weeds, perennial invasives like quackgrass in the north, keeping mulch to suppress weeds in place, etc. Gardening BMPs. I guess that's good advice. 
Yep, agreed. I think a lot of times when folks are, local folks are speaking at trainings, they're always saying, you know, it's just like a garden. If you don't tend it, it's not going to work anymore. It's, you know, things are going to die. So you constantly have to tend it just like you would any other garden, uh, but also making sure you have the right plants that are both um, can be, you know, tolerant of drought and also tolerant of wet, wet um, climates as well, because they're going to experience both of those things. What I, I just have to add this, I think it's kind of funny. We recently wrote a case study about um, a rain garden workshop that was held in American Samoa, and um, taro is a is a native plant there, and so they've been using rain gardens to help with storm water, both uh, the quality issue and, and the quantity issue, and so they put taro in there, and they said that someone had actually come and harvested the, the taro, and so they were like, we're not sure if we're going to use edible plants next time, because <laughs> it might not be the best thing to eat, and then also, you know, somebody took their plant, so they said, you know, education goes a long way, too, to help people kind of understand what, what's there, but I thought that was kind of a cute story, so... It is, and and we'll we'll leave it at that. We're now at two thirty, uh, and so we've reached the end of of this webcast. Uh, I do want to thank uh, our speakers, Lauren Long and Tasha Allen, for this uh, really informative, entertaining, and uh, and and fun webinar. Um, I've I got my uh, my my LID uh, quotient filled up and uh, gotten a great update on, on the, the state of the technology and a lot of resources and some great questions. We didn't ab we're not able to get to all the questions, but I'll happily send them off to both Lauren and Tasha so that they uh, can answer them as, um, as, they're, as they're able to. So that we're at the end of the webcast. Uh, if you want to log your credits, remember go to the County Planning Division when you're logging in and for, for your credits uh, and search for the, um, the title, Be Project Ready, Go from Opportunistic to Strategic Green Infrastructure, or search by the event number 9016766. That's all for today. Thanks very much, everyone.